here. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a word that you probably have heard a whole lot about over the past couple of weeks, and that word is viruses, viruses, viruses. I'm going to be teaching you how to keep yourself safe during the COVID-19 pandemic. The most important thing that you can do is to make sure that you're practicing good hand washing. Today we're going to be learning about germs, bacteria, and viruses. And even though you can't see them, they're too small, too tiny for you to see with your naked eye, we're going to pretend today that we can see them. We're going to be using black pepper to represent the germs. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sprinkle a whole lot of black pepper into this bowl of water just to demonstrate for you how important hand washing is. When you're washing your hands, it's very important that you're using an antibacterial soap. Now the germs and viruses that can sometimes attract themselves to our hands are easily removed if you are washing your hands very good. Today we're gonna to be using dish detergent to show you how germs, bacteria, and viruses move away when they come in contact with soap. So what I'm going to do is pour a little bit of dish detergent on my hands. And recommended by the CDC is that we wash our hands for at least 20 seconds. That's equivalent to singing happy birthday twice. I'm just going to sing it one time. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Amanda. Happy birthday to you. Now I'm ready to wash my hands. I want you to pay attention to what happens to the pepper, AKA bacteria and viruses, when I put my hands in the water, now that they have soap on them. Notice how the pepper is now moving away from my hands and into the side of the bowl. This happens because germs are not attracted to the antibacterial soap, hence the word antibacterial. So remember, the most important thing that you can do to keep yourself safe is to wash your hands. Thanks. See you guys later. My name is Keila Wright, and I'm an academic coach with the Meridian Public School District. I'm honored to share a lesson with you today. So let's get right to it because teaching from a virtual platform can get a little technical. For today's lesson, we're going to be looking at standard RI 4.3. RI 4.3 will call for the student to explain events, procedures, ideas, or concepts in a historical, scientific, or technical text including what happened and why, based on specific information in the text. Okay, so let's see what you already know. What if you enlisted your dad to help you bake your mama cake for Mother's Day, but neither of you knew how? What would you do? I'll give you a minute to think. You bet. It probably would be in your family's best interest to follow a proven recipe. Here is a technical text from the Center of Disease Control. So let's read this together. First, we'll start by reading the title together. On three. One, two, three. Follow five steps to wash your hands the right way. Good job. Because technical texts tell us precisely how to make or do things, what are we gonna be doing here today? You're smart. We are going to learn how to wash our hands Mrs. Wright's way. Oh, I'm sorry. You're not gonna be learning my way. You're gonna be learning to wash your hands the right way. Now follow along as I read aloud. Washing your hands is easy and it's one of the most effective ways to prevent the spread of germs. Clean hands can stop germs from spreading from one person to another and throughout an entire community from your home and workplace to childcare facilities and hospitals. Follow these five steps every time. Step one, wet your hands with clean running water, warm or cold, turn off the tap and apply soap. Step two, 
Lather your hands by rubbing them together with the soap. Lather the backs of your hands between your fingers and under your nails. Step three, scrub your hands for at least 20 seconds. You need a timer? If you don't have a timer, just hum the happy birthday song from beginning to end two times. Step four, rinse your hands well under clean running water. And the last step, step five, dry your hands using a clean towel or air dry them. Way to stay focused on the text. That's going to give you an advantage. Now with the text in mind, let's answer a couple of questions. Someone in your household washed their hands without soap. What would you say to convince him or her to use soap every single time they wash their hands to help prevent the spread of germs? Think about that for a second. Let's see what you know. Explain to someone in your family the five steps to properly wash your hands. I'm going to help you out a little bit. I'll give you two full minutes to explain and I'll pantomime to help you through it. You can do this. You're a wildcat. Time starts now. First, wet your hands and apply soap. Next, lather soap all over your hands. Then scrub for at least 20 seconds. Now rinse your hands with clean water and last air dry or dry with a clean towel. So let's check for understanding. Thumbs up if you can explain it to someone in your family or I might need a little more help or guidance. And that's okay. Technical texts are fun. There are so many things, so many new things that you can try following a technical text. So I'm gonna challenge you to create your own technical text tonight. I would like for you to create a how to make your bed guide tonight, and then you are going to allow a parent or sibling in your home to read and follow the, the, the precise directions that you wrote to see if they're able to follow your step-by-step -step how to make a bed technical guide. That was fun. Let's do it again sometime. Take care, Wildcats. Hello, good people. This is Stephen D. Shavick, your local science instructional specialist. And today we're gonna to have a small talk about microbes. There's nowhere you can turn right now and not discuss COVID-19 and hygiene and hand washing and wearing masks and staying safe. Uh, and in the midst of that, we're getting a lot of information as well as misinformation about what germs are, what causes them, uh, where they come from. And for some people, uh, this is a totally new concept that, you know, we've introduced some new thing into the world that seeks to make us unhealthy. Uh, when quite the opposite is true. Uh, microbes are these tiny things that are around us and have been for a very, very, very long time. And so we want to just have a quick discussion about what microbes are, how some of them are beneficial to us and what makes them very different from uh, the pathogens and viruses that we are hearing a lot about in the news today. First off, we need to understand that they are everywhere. Microbes are everywhere. They are in our intestines, they're on our skin, they're in the air, they're in the dirt, they're in the bottom of the ocean. Uh, because they are so old, they've been here long before we were and will be here long after us, I presume. Um, they're decomposers, they, they're in the ground, uh, they help with uh, the cycle and balance of the world, some of the cycles of matter as well as homeostasis within our body. And so we have learned uh, through adaptation to live harmoniously with the vast majority of microbes. So the bulk of these things are out minding their business, we're minding our business, and a few of them uh, help us maintain that business, keep our health in, in balance. So let's quickly talk about a few of the most common microbes you will hear and discuss. First off is bacteria. Everyone knows about bacteria and it kind of has a bad rep. Uh, you never hear anything positive about bacteria. Bacteria are living things. They are unicellular and they're prokaryotes. What that means is that their body is made entirely of one cell. So they are unicellular 
And in that cell, they have genetic information that just kind of floats around. They don't have a nucleus that helps contain that uh, genetic information. It's just kind of floating in there like chicken noodle soup. So they are unicellular prokaryotes. They are very old. They are pretty much the oldest living things on the earth, um, which is why there are so many of them and why they will be here long after us. Um, we often classify them by their shape. So when we name bacteria, a lot of the names come from the fact that they are shaped a certain way. When you think of uh, strep throat, if you've had bacterial strep, that's caused by a bacterium called uh, pneumococcus or streptococcus. And the coccus part means that it's shaped like little spheres or little pearls. Uh, there's some that are shaped like rods, which we call bacillus, and some are shaped like spirals, which we call spirochetes. Bacteria are useful to us, uh, one, for fermentation. So if you are like me and can't live without dairy, then you owe a lot of uh, thanks and gratitude to bacteria for making cheese and yogurt for us. Um, also in our gut, we have something called normal gut flora. So when you uh, have uh, a meal that doesn't quite agree with you, sometimes, oftentimes, it's because it contains bacteria that don't uh, mesh well with your normal gut flora. So we've got a host of bacteria that live inside of us that kind of maintain a balance. And when there's something that doesn't uh, fit or they feel is not beneficial, then they make ways to make sure that it's expelled and expelled quickly. And so bacteria uh, on our skin is one line of defense. Our skin itself is a barrier, but also the bacteria that lives there uh, kind of make sure that we maintain a healthy balance of good bacteria and things that shouldn't be there, they quickly fight off for us. If we look at the uh, characteristics of most bacteria, uh, they have some way of kind of moving around. So they may have a tail called flagellum, or they may have hairs on the outside of their body called cilia that help them move. And again, they have some form of genetic information inside of them. It just floats around or it's a loop, a capsid, a uh, plasmid, but does not have a nucleus. Another group of microbes that we hear about are the fungi. Fungi can be either unicellular or multicellular, and they are eukaryotes. So first off, unicellular meaning they can be made of one cell entirely, or they're made of multiple cells, uh, making them multicellular. And most things that are multicellular are things that we can see with the naked eye. And they are eukaryotes. So we said a prokaryote does not have a nucleus. Eukaryotes have a nucleus. So they have uh, DNA or RNA, most of these will have DNA uh, that is enclosed within a nucleus inside their cells. The multicellular fungi are things like mushrooms, things that we can see all the time. Uh, more microscopic or the unicellular versions would be things that can produce uh, spores or branches, which we call hyphae. So when we hear uh, yeast or mildew or mold, uh, those are uh, microscopic versions of fungi. We also use fungi in fermentation, so similar to the cultures that we use for uh, cheese and milk, uh, we use fungi uh, to help ferment things in the process of making you know, beer, making certain wines, making bread. And so again, sheltering in place, uh, we owe a lot of gratitude to bacteria and fungi for some things that are helping maintain our, our happy place for us. So fungi, unicellular, multicellular, eukaryotes, uh, they're useful in fermentation. Um, also bacteria and fungi alike uh, are used in some medicine production. Uh, we're talking about uh, penicillin. Penicillin was first produced uh, from a mold called penicillin, and it's the first antibiotic. And so we use uh, that technology, uh, thanks again to fungi. Um, also, when we're producing insulin, which is a hormone needed uh, for those that suffer from diabetes, and we need to make it in a much more rapid uh, process that so we can use bacterial cells, introduce a human insulin gene into the bacterial cell. It will replicate and can make the hormone insulin in faster ways than uh, humans can on their own. So again, thinking of ways that microbes are beneficial to us, fungi and bacteria, you know, do a lot of helpful things for us. Another category that we don't hear as much about are the protists. And I think of the protists uh, kind of like the bargain bin at Walmart. It's just kind of a random assortment of living things that don't quite fit in any other category. Um, they are mostly unicellular. So again, they are made, the entire bodies are just one cell and they are eukaryotes, so they have a nucleus. We often describe them as miscellaneous. They're not 
you know, quite this or quite that. We can say they're animal-like or plant-like or bacteria-like, fungi-like, but not necessarily enough of the characteristic to be a full uh, fungus or plant or animal. Examples of this would be an amoeba. It's kind of like a single cell blob, has pseudopods to help move it around. Or we think of um, algae as another form of protus. Lastly, we have viruses. And viruses are kind of the odd man out in this group because per our definition, microbes are tiny living things, but viruses are not living. In all the other categories, we describe them as something cellular, either unicellular or multicellular, and a requirement for life is you must be made of cells. Cells are the kind of workhorse or the functional unit of every living thing. It allows us to use and produce energy, to uh, reproduce, to repair our cells, and so without uh, the cell, none of that happens. And so viruses share some characteristics with these other microbes. They do have some form of genetic information, which allows them to uh, send out the instructions for what they need to do, but they can't do that without some of the uh, machinery in actual cells. And so viruses are kind of like uh, robots or clones that have to hijack a cell in order to work. They need the ribosomes to help make proteins, which they don't have on their own. And so a virus has to find a way to get into a living host, get into the cells of that host, and it uses that cell to make copies of itself. Uh, most viruses have what we call a protein coat, and that protein coat has receptors on it that allows it to kind of blend and, and uh, disguise itself so that it can uh, get into cells without being detected. Um, those receptors are kind of like keys that allow them to unlock the cells within our bodies or other living things. And then using its genetic information, it then uh, overtakes uh, the machinery inside the cell, the ribosomes, protein factory to make copies of itself. And then it bursts out the cell and moves on to other places. And so viruses are not living things, but because of some of their uh, mechanisms and how they uh, have to replicate, they're often used uh, or clumped together in this group. So a big thing that uh, we often walk away with when we talk about these microbes is how do we treat them? And so they're not all created equally because bacteria, protists, and fungi are living things. We often use medications called antibiotics uh, to treat them. Literally the word anti against and biotic, bio referring to living things. So medications that work against these living things that are causing problems in our body. And they are often either static, meaning they slow uh, the process. So if it's replicating or reproducing itself, then it does things to help slow that process or stop it. Or they're cytal, where they actually work to kill the microbe itself. Because viruses are not living, we can't use an antibiotic against it. We can't kill something that's not living. And so we often use vaccines to treat viruses. And what the vaccine does is it introduces a part of a virus into our body so that our immune system, the white blood cells, can uh, mount an immune response. They make antibodies so that they can remind themselves the next time they see a virus that looks similar, they can mount a response much quicker and deal with that virus. And so I want to leave with an understanding that microbes are these tiny things that we live with all day, every day. Um, our body has natural defenses against the majority of them. Uh, many of these microbes we live with uh, peacefully. They don't cause problems. And because viruses are a special type of uh, small things in the world around us, uh, sometimes we have difficulty in treating them. But again, with the advent of medicine, we have vaccines that allow us to do that. And our body is also smart. It can develop new ways to address those receptors and protein coats. So I don't want any of us living in fear that, you know, there's some new wave of small things that we can't see that are going to take over. Uh, we have adapted and lived as humans for this amount of time fighting against pandemics and epidemics for this long. And so being informed is part of scholarship and hopefully you are continue to do that as you're at home enjoying your families. As always, remember that MPSB loves and misses you. And this has been your science moment with Mr. Shadwick. Until next time.